A reading from the second book of Kings. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were here with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elijah sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure his leprosy. Are not Obana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. The word of the Lord. Thank you, to God. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I know you were wondering which words I was singing to that uh, gospel <laughs> hymn. I'll keep that my secret. <laughs> so you have to ignore my British accent. <laughs> well, that may be the only reason you hired me. Uh, I live in a town named after the commander of the Continental Army in the War of Independence. <laughs> We own, we own a home in a town in which the first tea party took place, Edenton, October 1774. So I think I can, as an American citizen, wish you all a happy and a glorious force. <laughs> On recent Sundays, we have heard and read passages from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. In this book, and it's a sort of primer, for his magisterial tome of the book to the Romans, Paul talks much about freedom. And surely on this Independence Day weekend, where we celebrate in so many ways, one thing that should be at the core of our hearts and our minds is freedom. Paul writes that freedom is a precious and a costly gift. Galatians chapter 6, he says, May I never glory in anything except the cross of Christ, by which Christ is crucified to me and I to the world. Paul reminds the Galatian Christians that their freedom was won at great cost. And so are freedoms today. They are costly. He then goes on to say, just as important, that freedom is fragile. It can be easily lost. He begins chapter 3 of Galatians by saying, you stupid Galatians. <laughs> you started with the spirit in freedom and you're leaning back into captivity. 
some, many, many years back when I was at seminary, what I used to call theological college, uh, for evening prayer I was given this passage, chapter 3, to read. I had such fun standing up, looking at the students and especially the faculty at the back, beginning by saying, you stupid people. <laughs> But you see what Paul is saying. Freedom is costly. And freedom is fragile. In Old City, Philadelphia, there is Christ Church, Episcopal Church, founded in 1695. It's building probably one of the finest Georgian buildings in America, dates to 1774. It was there that many of the writers of the Constitution rested and worshipped during their mammoth task. The church holds many, as you would expect, many historic relics. But one of the things it holds is an English prayer book brought over from uh, England. And where prayers are made for King George III, somebody has taken a pencil and scratched out these names. And they've kept it there to remind people. But someone cared that much about freedom to do something like that. Such was the care for freedom. And brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to ask ourselves, do we observe the same care for our freedoms? Not just in Christ, but also in state. In today's first reading, and you must have found that first reading amusing. I mean, it's full of comical turns and phrases. In today's first reading, we read of a man renowned and famous. Naaman was captain of the host of the king of Syria. He was successful in battle. He was an honorable man. He was a man of valor. He was an influential man in high favor with his master. And he was revered. Did you note this? He was revered even by his servants. The very people whom he had taken captive in Israel and brought to Syria, these people still revered him. But despite all his glory, Naaman was not free. He was taken captive by a disease that would slowly rot his body and alienate him from society. Oh yes, by his great armour, he could cover up that disease, but nevertheless it wore away. It eroded his soul. I read recently a story of Robert Redford that one day he was walking through a hotel and heading for the elevator and a woman rushed up to him and she said, uh, are you the real Robert Redford? <laughs> and as the doors were closing, he said, only when I'm alone. Naaman gave all appearance that he was free. But alone, when the armor came off, he knew he was bound. Friends, there is many a family whose appearances they are is that they are happy, functional, and yet behind it all they lack a precious freedom. Friends, there is many a person who gives the appearance of a successful, wholesome life, and yet behind it all, they lack a precious freedom. There is many a church that gives the appearance of a spiritual and welcoming community. Yet behind it all, it lacks a precious freedom. And friends, there is doubtless many a nation that gives the appearance of being freedom-loving, freedom-bestowing. And yet behind it all, it lacks a precious freedom. Naaman was such. Are we? 
In our story from 2 Kings, I want you now to contrast the life of that young girl taken captive from the land of Israel. Sadly, she is anonymous. She plays a big part in the story. And you see how free she is from anger and resentment. Even though Naaman led the army that took her captive, now holds her captive in his home, that young girl was so free from anger and resentment that she took time to suggest how her master could be healed and made whole, set free from a voracious disease. She approaches Naaman's wife with this message. I know a man who can make him well. And it occurs to me that this, in a way, is our ministry as a church and as Christians, that we approach others without favor, without prejudice, without bigotry. And we find ways to let them know, I know a man who could make you well, Jesus. And so the story continues. And as it unfolds, both the kings of Syria and Israel add nothing but confusion and chaos. But then, as an American, what do we expect from kings? (laughs) So here we are, very close to the moment of his healing. And what happens? Naaman starts to retract and recoil from the prophet's prescription. He becomes angry and resentful that the prophet does not deem it proper to leave his house to meet this mighty soldier. You notice he wanted him to come over and wave his hands all over the place. You see, he's being swayed by a sense of pride. Why should I wash in this filthy river? Why not in the clean rivers of my own Abana and Farpa? And you know, once again, it is the servants with tender care for their master who plead the cause for sanity and obedience. And so we read, he went down, immersed himself, seven times in the Jordan, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Goodness, there are many people looking for that river Jordan. God worked two miracles in Naaman. The first miracle was that he was set free from pride and prejudice, from arrogance and bias, from conceit and bigotry. The second miracle was that he was set free from that terrible sickness. This past week, you probably saw it on the front page of the Daily News, I read the story of Washington's big dog in the park. Did you see it? Lincoln, this enormous dog apparently, amazes spectators by his obedience even while unleashed. His owner, Chris Rivenbach, said, the dog respects and trusts his owner's voice. He listens intently and obeys immediately. You know what I'm going to say. (laughs) Friends, we belong, we are owned by the one who has made us, sustained us, saved us, restores us. We are his. We are to respect his voice, listen intently and obey immediately that we may be free and that freedom may ring and reign in home, in church, and in state. Amen.